okay so we'll today be discussing uniaxial loading and deformation and this perhaps you can see as something which is uh, pushing into the course pushing us into the course um, of solid mechanics so let's see uh, how we can grab and understand these concepts so there are uh, some basic types of deformation uh, which we will take in most of the problems over here and uh, that would be looking like this figure a so let's see what it means this is a bar which is loaded by two forces and you are interested in the relative motion of the points of application of the two forces okay so you have a p which is applied at both the ends and you want to find this delta 1 which is the extension in this bar okay due to the application of this force now what you have to do is you have to actually consider three rods one two three apply the same load as you can see in these diagrams which is p okay and they are of the same material okay it may be iron or wood or any other ceramic but the idea is that all of these three situations are of the same material and uh, the difference is that they are of different lengths initial undeformed lengths it is l1 in this case l2 in this case l3 in this case okay they are also of different areas where a1 is an a2 and a3 okay and so that's what we mean uh, by having this uh, same material in different dimensions in the last case we have taken a3 is equal to a2 and we'll see what it means okay so this is the situation these are essentially three experiments which you are doing you are pulling it and in one some tests an experiment of yours in your undergraduate you will definitely do this test uh, in a machine called a utm machine a universal testing machine and you can do an experiment like that so it's always easy to measure the force and the displacements the extensions of the bar can also be measured now what you are doing is this you are actually increasing the load in each experiment from 0 to p slowly okay it's not suddenly you are not applying a load p you are increasing the load from 0 to this value of p and you are doing it slowly the reason you want to do it slowly is very similar to your uh, sort of quasi static situations which you do okay remember i mean in your first year physics or even before that when you want to say that the potential due to a charge uh, is the amount of work which you have to bring in to bring a unit charge from infinity to a certain distance r from this charge q okay and similarly a gravitational potential is also defined and this bringing from infinity to this distance r from this charge has to also be done slowly the idea is all this has to happen as a quasi static uh, uh, in a quasi static way so that you can assume that there is equilibrium at every stage of this process okay that's the meaning i mean there's no acceleration at any stage okay the final elongation is definitely delta it's denoted by delta 1 delta 2 delta 3 in each of the three cases now it is said that the if the maximum elongation is small okay is small actually very small then the variation of 
P with delta, which is the force by delta. And as I've said, you are increasing P very slowly from zero to a certain value will look like either B or it will look like C. Okay. So one denotes this. So as you know, I mean, you must have done experiments before when you do an actual experiment, you get these data points like them. Okay. And uh, then you have sort of a best fit curve. In this case, the best fit curve would turn out to be a linear relationship for experiment one, this one, for experiment two, this one, and experiment three, this one. And for some other class of materials, maybe say a rubber, okay, you will not have a linear relationship between these data points. So the best fit curve will actually be some sort of a non-linear curve. Okay, so this material is called a linear material and this material is called non-linear material. If you have, uh, if you have increased the load slowly from zero to P, okay. So this is, these are the two categories broadly in which you will be able to categorize the materials around you. Okay. Now, if you plot the same experiment, the exact same experiment, uh, when you divide P by A, okay, A is the area of that bar initial area of that bar you know that the area will keep on changing but when i say divide by area you divide by the original undeformed area so in this case in experiment one you would divide it by a1 in experiment two you would divide by a2 and so on and similarly you want to divide the delta by the original length in this case it will be l1 l2 and l3 Okay, so you will have a delta 1 by L1, delta 2 by L2 and so on. So once you do this, you will notice that all the three curves over here actually represent the same line in this curve. Meaning if you normalize, if you divide the load by the area and the displacements or the displacements of the bar with the original length of the bar, then you get just one single line. So all your data points will then lie on this one single line. Okay. Similarly for the non-linear materials as well. If you make these divisions and plot this graph, all of them will lie on the same non-linear uh, curve. Okay. Now this tells us something very important. This tells you that the ratio between also the relationship between P by A and delta by L is a material property and is independent of dimensions okay a or l so because you will get the same linear behavior or the non linear behavior irrespective of what the original length or the area of that bar is so you can easily say that this relationship does not actually depend on the dimensions and hence you call it a material property. It is a property of the material. Okay. So we will limit our discussions only to the linear class of materials. Okay. And it has got nothing to do with your being in say second year of your undergraduate degree linear elasticity as it is called later on is a very very widely used methods and it is known to approximate even some of the slightly non-linear materials okay so even until 
post doc and phd level or oh sorry uh, masters and phd level people continue using linear elasticity only so what you are learning is the founding block of many many problems which can be solved using this so non linear materials is slightly harder and more specialized unless you are dealing with a material which cannot show a linear behavior like say the tissues and muscles in your body rubber polymers and materials like that that you cannot use linear uh, relationships and then you are forced to go into non linear but for most materials around you linear elasticity works and it works well so that's why we will be confining ourselves to this particular relationship only okay so for this class of material uh, you have seen that the relationship between p by a and delta by l will actually be a slope so that slope is okay for this graph this is called the modulus of elasticity of any material okay this is a definition it's essentially the slope of this line and that's how it is defined now you can look up uh, table 2.1 in your textbook okay you can look up table 2.1 in your textbook and then you will be able to find uh, the values of this modulus of elasticity for different materials for example steel has a elasticity modulus of 205 into 10 raised to the power of 6 kN per meter square compare that to rubber that is only around 50 into 10 raised to the power of 2 kN per meter square okay so the stiffness is much higher the young modulus is much higher for a steel compared to a rubber or any other epoxy and so on okay so that is something which you can easily uh, observe from the table 2.1 and you will be using table 2.41 for some other data as in solving the problem so i think it's a good time to um, use it i um, mean start using it okay now if you rephrase this relationship i'm just rubbing this part out you can find the displacements in terms of the young's modulus i mean you can look up a table and then you can always say well the displacement will be p which is the load l the initial length a the area of the cross section of the bar and e the modulus of elasticity if you know all these things you can find how much displacement will there be okay so this is called the hooks law okay so it is called the hooks law and it was named after robert hook who had propounded at one time that uh, there is a linear relationship between load and displacement okay he didn't actually give this law but uh, it is attributed to him okay so this is how you can sort of read this uh, part and uh, as i have said even when there is a slight non linearity you can still assume in many cases a linear material for example materials like cast iron which are somewhat brittle compared to the steels around you they have a slightly non linear relationship but they are well uh, i mean they it is very easy for us to assume that linear elasticity is valid in those cases okay so as i've said this is what you are uh, this is what you are want to study for this course and perhaps many other courses if you take unless you take up some specialized course which i don't think normally undergraduate students take okay so that's the first uh, sort of discussion which we had for today now let's move ahead and okay now let's 
move to section 2.4 which is about statically determinate situations and uh, see how we can proceed over here so remember there were some ideas contained in equation 2.1 okay the first step was about the force and equilibrium the second step was about deformation and geometric compatibility and third step was about the relationship between force and displacement okay so that's the most straightforward way to solve uh, many problems and in this section you will only consider statically determinate situations you already know what a statically indeterminate situation is so let's start with statically determinate situations and uh, we will then move along uh, into the statically indeterminate situations okay so let's look at this uh, triangular frame supporting a 10 to 10 uh, 20 kilo newtons load i mean we have already seen this earlier but now we have a slightly more detailed diagram okay i mean in essentially it's the same problem but now you have more details about it this is to inculcate or include the new knowledge which we just had have learned okay so this was the same frame which was considered in example 1.3 in this instance there is a type of materials and the size is given okay and the nature of connections is specified in much more greater detail our objective is to estimate the displacement at the point d due to the 20 kilonewtons load carried by the joint chain hoist so you want to find the displacement at this point okay so we'll continue with the same sort of uh, so we want to do the first step okay which is force equilibrium and this was already done for you remember there was an assumption which we had taken that this bolted joint was actually assumed to be a pin the reasoning which we had given was that if it is not tightened enough and it will be loose and hence it might allow a free rotation then you have this situation where uh, the bolted joint can be taken as a pin joint so the force and equilibrium conditions are already shown to you in um, uh, this this figure which is 2.7 um, okay over here this figure so this is the force diagrams which you have so we had already made this derivation before okay so we are not going through that discussion if you want to see how these numbers are coming how these directions are coming please go to that discussion which we had made earlier the t over here and the c over here means tension and compression meaning this bar bd will be under under tension and the bar cd will be under compression so this is something which we had uh, done now let's skip ahead and first write the relationship between force and displacement in this case okay we will come to i mean theoretically we should actually study the deformation beforehand but because it is a slightly complicated situation over here so that's why we are doing the easier things first okay and hence we are writing the force deformation relation we will just use the hooke's law which we have studied uh, before and we'll be able to write delta bd 
is equal to f into l by a e or b d. Similarly, you will be able to write delta c d and this you should be able to write f l by a e or c d. So you will have to find the, vol uh, the values of uh, modulus of elasticity from the table for bar CD and bar BD they are of the same steel rod steel rod is mentioned for you okay so you can choose any value which is given in the table so then the, in your solutions we have taken the maximum possible value even if you take don't take the maximum possible value so that is also okay like 194 to 205 10 to the power of 6 kilonewton per meter square is taken in your table they have taken the maximum value you are free to take okay the areas are already given to you in the question look at over here okay so you substitute that make sure the units are consistent and the lengths were already given to you beforehand and also in this problem so i think it should be okay so that's what you have with you you have the delta bd meaning the extension in um, bd this one and delta cd the compression in this one this you already have what is the objective remember it is to find the displacement of uh, d the point d so where would the point d move okay and this should have a, both a horizontal and a vertical component and we'll have to find both any displacement it's a planar problem so it would have two components and we'll find both of them okay now let's discuss the geometric compatibility Okay, so there are some requirements of the bars, okay. One of the things is that the bars can only, bars can only extend or compress. Beams on the other hand can bend. So this is something which we will deal later on right now we will confine ourselves to bars which can extend and compress so as we have seen that the bd bar is under tension so it must extend the cd bar is under compression and it should compress okay so the bars will change lengths by the amounts which are calculated above okay these are you have already calculated how much is the change in length in these bars and the they have to remain straight i mean they cannot bend that's the definition of a bar and also remain fastened at d so they must also remain fastened at d okay so this can uh, compress this can extend but this joint must still be intact so this is what we have and once you find the final position of D you have your answer okay so now let's assume for a moment that there is a decoupling or uncoupling at D okay so assume and we will you will see why this is needed assume for a moment in the sense it's not an assumption until the end it is just an assumption uh, uh, right now okay that uh, this is there and this you have done in several problems of mechanics before okay so you assume a uncoupling at uh, at okay at t and uh, they are allowed to change delta BD and delta CD so that the bars now are of lengths BD1 and CD1. 
so bd has become of length bd1 okay and cd has become of length cd2 you see why we are using a symbol d1 and d2 because you have assumed a d uncoupling at d here you have a d and here you have a d because they are initially at the same point but finally we are assuming that they are extending independent of each other so you see from the sketch over here this this sketch so you had this b d initially like this okay then there was a tension and then there was an extension delta b d the value of which you have already found out okay from here so that BD1 is the new length of this bar. Similarly, CD, if you look, okay, CD. You already knew the original length and the orientation, and you knew how much contraction has happened. So delta CD amount of contraction has happened. Okay, and this point D has moved to this point D2. Okay. So CD has moved to CD2. So that's how you would read this particular um, figure. Now, you can see from the sketch that you can bring the ends D1 and D2 into coincidence. So this is the statement which you make after this. But d1 and d2 are coincident right i mean that was just for the moment you had assumed that uh, they are uncoupled but d1 and d2 have to be the same point so what is the possibility that d1 and d2 will be at the same point keeping in mind that they must still be formed as this okay so the way is for bd okay this one draw a arc like this okay what is the advantage of this arc all these lengths are actually equal to bd1 similarly for the cd2 okay this deformed length draw an arc like this using a, a compass okay you take you nail it over here and with the pencil you can trace this similarly nail it over here with the pencil you can trace this. So every point on this arc will be of the length CD2, okay, and they will intersect at one point. That point is D3, and this is our point, meaning at D3 both BD1 and CD2 intersect. So this D3, both of them will satisfy and hence this is our point. This is the deformed point, the deformed state. Okay. So that's easy and uh, that's how you would find. So what would be then the displacement of uh, uh, you have to draw a position vector from here to D3. Let me just zoom in. Okay. Yeah, that would be much better. So if you are found, I mean, as, as in the question, you have to find the displacement of point D. Please draw a position vector from here. Sorry, where did it go? Okay, from here until here, and this is the displacement. So it will have a horizontal component. This one, it will have a vertical component, and you can give your answer. That's the final answer to your problem. Okay. This was the sort of most accurate method to go about this uh, problem and uh, this should 
and in current times i mean doing all this is not hard in the sense you can always put the equations of uh, two circles in a computer and you will be given the point of intersection automatically instantly it's very easy to do okay however you have to recall that there is a history behind engineering i mean engineering didn't start when computers started engineering was there long before computers came and the computation was there so people used to then use an actual compass okay and then all this will become slightly more cumbersome if you are trying to do all that so there was an easier approximation to this method and that is what we'll be discussing uh, now okay it's a lengthy calculation what we have just discussed and uh, you know that i mean you know that the finding the intersections of two circles is a lengthier problem than finding the intersection of two straight lines right you can have two straight lines and it will be easier for you to find the solution you have two circles finding the solutions for that is much more complicated than finding the intersection of two lines so that's what it means if it's harder for you it's harder for a computer and we want a faster answer okay so we will now exploit the fact that these deformations are actually small and let's see how we can use that okay so the basic idea is this that if the deformations are small which they are i mean in this case uh, deformations have to be very small i mean remember the deltas have to be very small this was in the definitions also in our earlier discussion today you can replace the arc by tangents to the arc look at this case if this is a uh, your bd or cd or whatever it was and if this is the arc okay you can approximate this arc by a tangent okay this is the initial position this is the final position and if this is actually small this extension is small then this arc can be approximated by the tangent to the arc and that is exactly what we will be doing over here you will be replacing all the arcs with a tangent so i'll bring you closer over here okay so start with the point d1 you i'm saying this because you already know where d1 is you knew bd and you know delta bd so you can find d1 now rather than drawing this whole arc what you do is you just draw a tangent to this okay this one similarly you have this arc okay cd2 you draw a tangent over here these two tangents will intersect at this point d4 okay and this is approximately so this d4 is what d3 was in the earlier case and d4 is the final position of the point d and with this you can find your displacement of point t okay so that is what you have done and the basic premise and the basic need is it's just easier to work with the lines rather than curves okay okay so where we sort of uh, stop this particular uh, problem 
let's move to the next problem again something which we had uh, seen uh, before okay so i mean the answer for the previous question would be if from t you have to come down to delta v in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction you would know how much it has changed okay okay so now look at this uh, case of this truss structure again you have seen this before it's from the example 1.4 it has the, exactly the same loads only thing is now the material is aluminum okay the material was missing uh, before and the cross sectional area of the outer bars is 20 cm square and the inner bars is 10 cm square okay so this is the new information you have and the question is that you want to find how much the length of each member changes during loads so what is the change in length of each member so we start again with the steps which was force equilibrium So this is easily shown over here by the exact same methods which we used before. So there is nothing new in step 1. Okay. So I mean and C and T again are the compression and tension which is shown for each bar. So this one if you remember I mean from your perhaps in your first year in mechanics it was dis dis uh, discussed this member has a zero force so it's called a zero force member okay it does not experience any force for that matter so that's why you can uh, that's why that's how you can find out all these values so that part is done the second part would be about the geometric compatibility okay so this part is something new and we shall discuss this. So the members, I mean, if you see all these bars, they make up uh, several triangles, right? Triangle, 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 and so on. So there are these one, two, three, four triangles. I mean, you can take more combinations and you can still find that there are lots of other triangles as well. So the members uh, of the truss make up a series of triangles and the truss is the sum of these triangles. If the pins are frictionless and allow free rotation, then the three members which form any triangle also will form a triangle if the three members change their lengths. Now I would request you to please focus on any triangle. Let's focus on this triangle. okay the idea is this that these these joints one two three they are all pin joints in the sense the joint will still be intact okay each of these members this one this one or this one can only compress or extend okay so this will continue to remain a triangle even in the deformed state so you look at this the dashed line over here shows the undeformed shape and this solid line shows the deformed state so this is the geometric compatibility of this particular problem okay that uh, they will also form a triangle if they change in length and change in length can be either extension or um, compression but uh, they will continue to remain a triangle and the same holds for all the triangles so this uh, figure which you have in front of you 2.9 c that shows how it should look like in a deformed 
situation it will still be a collection of triangles and uh, that's how i mean the situation would be very different if this any bar was allowed to bend okay then you will not have a triangle but right now you are considering only bars and not a beam so they can only compress or extend so they must form a triangle only you will see that problems of beams beams later on and then you cannot make this assumption okay so the other part is if you have adjacent triangles they can distort independently of each other in the present example since the roller support at b is free to move horizontally to accommodate a distortion of the triangles which make up the truss so this roller which you have it can move any way horizontally so it will facilitate this uh, movement this uh, formation of these new triangles in any way which seems there so they are actually they can form independently of each other okay now you can conclude that each member of the truss is free to lengthen or shorten without any restraint being imposed by the other members of the truss that's also uh, reasonable to assume so you just make a Uh, make a displacement for all of them and okay so take a delta ac so delta ad and so on okay and this was initially 5 okay this length was initially 5 i don't know why okay let's take this one this was initially 2 meters and now you are taking a delta ad which is there and that's how you can find each one of these so delta ad is an unknown okay until now then when you find the step 3 which is the relation between force and deformation then you can find out for example delta ad will be equal to fl by a e for a c a t m sorry okay so what you must do is substitute the area of the bar a d substitute f in the bar a d what is the f which is 50 newtons l of the bar a d is 2 uh, meters and the young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity of aluminum you have to go to table 2.1 and there it says uh, 69 okay it's 69 into 10 to the power of 6 in your textbook they have taken 70 so you can take that and this you will get an answer of 0.057 cm extension okay and you knew that this is an extension because ad was under tension so it can only have uh, extension and this you add over here and then you will get the final length of this as 2.00057 meters okay so that's how you could solve uh, this uh, particular um, uh, problem now let's look at a last uh, problem which is somewhat easier to see of the statically determinate case you have a thin ring okay of internal radius r you have an internal radius r and thickness is t so this thickness is t for this ring and uh, the width is b so this is the width b and it is subjected to a uniform pressure p okay so this is the internal uniform pressure p over the entire uh, surface first of all looking at these two figures can you recall anything around you or where this you have where this is something which you can experience look at a aircraft okay 
there's a human inside an aircraft and you have to have a pressure of one atmosphere for us to for our body to function but the aircraft is at a much higher elevation from say the ground okay and here the pressure around is uh, p not which is very less compared to p inside so this is a similar situation okay the fuselage of the airplane is experiencing these pressures and in this problem you are, don't have an external pressure but more or less it's the same thing so you have a pressure internally and then there is a thickness of this fuselage okay which takes care of it now consider another situation say if you are buried uh, so if you have an ocean and you have a submarine and there's a human inside again the pressure as you know inside the ocean will be much higher okay uh, rho g h sort of a behavior with the pressure and this will be the external pressure but internally you must still maintain one atmosphere okay so this is that pressure uh, there are other pressure so this is all a, something called a pressure vessel you may have seen tankers of indian oil or bharat petroleum on the roads which carry uh, petroleum products to the petrol pumps you may have seen your gas cylinders at home which you use for cooking they all have gases at this pressure p and they are all like, applying that pressure uniformly on the boundary of their cylinder so all these are situations where this problem is relevant okay with minor modifications of course but this is where all of them are applied okay so you have this pressure and uh, uh, we have the shown this distribution we would like to determine the forces on the ring and we should also we also should like to determine the deformation of the ring due to the internal pressure okay so you have to allow certain deformation it's an elastic body it will deform and how much it should deform is uh, what you want to control okay so you start off with uh, the force equilibrium and this is something which you can may have done uh, beforehand you take up uh, so before examining in detail the free body diagram of 2.12c it will be instructive to examine the free body of the other half of the loop so let's take the other half of the loop okay uh, the directions of the forces ft and fr in figure 2.0 follow directly from those shown in figure 2.12c according to newton's third law okay so you have taken two parts one the you have basically cut it out from here and this is the upper part this is the lower part so fr will be acting inward okay on the upper half and outward in the lower half this action of the forces fr violates the symmetry which we expect to find in the two halves of the hoop so we can resolve this paradox only one way we must conclude that radial forces fr are zero i'll explain this what it is so if you want to sort of cut this out over here and draw the free body diagrams so the tangential component of the force you will take it in this direction for the upper half in this direction of the upper half and hence in the lower half for the equilibrium of this part in the tangential direction ft and ft must act equal and opposite okay similarly if you take the radial component of force in this particular form okay if in c for the sake of consistency and for equilibrium of this point in the radial direction fr must act in the opposite direction as at this now the problem is that uh, this will violate the symmetry of this problem taking this fr outward in one case and inward in the other case because you cannot have i mean it will violate the symmetry of this it's a symmetric uh, situation which you have in front of you so the only way to get rid of this is to take fr equal to 0 that way you will not have this problem and that's how you have resolved this okay so once this part is uh, done all you have to do is uh, you come back to this problem of 
the upper part because it's a symmetric problem so you can solve half of it even quarter of it for that matter but let's take half of it so in this case you have to consider a arc or length r delta theta so this is r delta theta and you know the thickness of it so the delta f p is equal to p into the area which is so pressure is pressure it has to be multiplied by area for it to be made a force is b r delta theta okay and uh, in the y direction if you want to uh, find the radial force you will just take a sine component of it similarly in the x direction you can take a cos and for if the delta theta is a very small angle then you can write sigma fy is equal to theta equal to 0 to pi pbr sin theta d theta minus 2 ft okay this is the force balance in the y direction which is a vertical direction and that would give you ft and uh, that's how you would do the force uh, equilibrium the second part would be about deformation which is very easy all you have to do is uh, you have to take assume that it's a plate of uh, thickness t with b okay and length is uh, 2 pi r plus t by 2 okay r as you know is going to the middle of this okay the middle of this is where the r is going so somewhere over here so t by 2 will add the other half of it okay and that way you can use the delta t into the f t by 2 pi r plus t by 2 by b t e Young's modulus you will have to find from the uh, table and then you can use if the material is given and then the last part would be about the geometric uh, compatibility so the circumference of the radius is r uh, rad uh, will, will be 2 pi r so an increase in delta t must be accompanied by a radial expansion uh, the idea is if you look at this figure since it's a symmetric problem it's a circle beforehand it will continue to be a circle thereafter as well so that is the geometric compatibility part of it okay so that is what you can do and in your textbook you have been given the mathematics of how this can be done you can just ignore some of the fractions which you think are small and then you can move ahead with this part okay so this was a good practical example for us so now in the next class we'll begin with statically indeterminate solutions so see you then